can read, you can write, and you might even be able to factor a trinomial or two. But I'm telling you, none of those things are going to be as useful to you as the ability to write code. Coding is the future. You're going to be doing it in some form or fashion. This world is built on technology. Now, there's another piece to this equation, and this may give you a little bit more comfort. There's something even more important than technology. There's something even more important than your ability to code. That something is you. That something is your mind, your ability to think, your ability to create. And so instead of talking about code for an hour, I'm going to talk about you for an hour. What do you need to do inside your head? What are you going to need to do for yourself that your parents can't get for you, that your teachers can't get for you? I'm going to take questions at the end. That your teachers can't get for you because that is your domain. No one knows your mind better than you. So I want to talk about you and inside of your head. And the first thing I want to straighten out is this whole idea that you can change the world. Have you ever been told that before? You can change the world. The actions you take can change the world. The ideas you have can change the world. No, they can't. And in fact, and in fact, the harder you try to change the world, the more the world is going to resist being changed. Here's the truth of the matter. You don't change the world, you hack it. The things that you build, you build on top of what is already there. So I want you to stop thinking big, and I want you to start thinking small. Because where did my, how did Microsoft get to be one of the most important, relevant companies on the planet? By thinking small. How did Google become one of the most important companies on the planet? By thinking small. How did Apple become one of the most important companies on the planet? By thinking small. Now, let me argue this for a second, because when Microsoft took over the world, the world was big. The world was full of these giant computers that each one of them had to be hand-programmed by a select few really smart people. That's how the world worked. Big businesses bought big computers and hired a bunch of people to program them. And Bill Gates took a look at this, and he didn't change the world. He hacked the world. He took a look at these computers and these people programming them and realized that the most important thing was that interface between the humans and the computers, the operating system. That's where he placed his bet. It wasn't his technology. It already existed. There's plenty of seats over here if you all want to just make your way, and you won't offend me if you walk in front of me either. The operating system, that's where he placed his bet, and that's how he won, and that's how Microsoft won. Google, did Google change the world? No, they hacked the world and allowed the world to change itself based on their hack. Google wasn't the first search engine. Yahoo was before them. Excite was before them. Lycos was before them. AltaVista was before them. There were dozens of search engines before Google. What did Google do? Did they think big? Did they say, oh, we're going to reinvent search? No, they didn't. They took a search algorithm and added about 100 lines of code. Page rank a different way of ordering search results. That was it. A small idea, a very small idea that happened to make Sergey and Larry billionaires and a company, one of the most relevant companies on the planet. Why? You want to be successful? Think small. The big ideas aren't going to work. The small ideas are going to work. The Tesla automobile. Did they reinvent wheels and chassis and windshields? No, they just put an electric motor in it. They're thinking small. Apple, chances are you have an iPhone in your pocket. Nope. What? <laughs> Thank you. They said, by the way, for the camera, they said no. Why is it that all of a sudden we had smartphones for decades? for a full decade before the iPhone came out. And the iPhone didn't come out until 2007. We had Blackberries, we had Windows CE, Nokia made them, Samsung made them, Palm Pilots, they were all out before the iPhone. Why did the iPhone make it? See, I'm teaching you all to think small. I'm teaching you to think small. Better doesn't matter. You gotta be 10X better before it matters and it's not 10X better. If you don't understand these small tweaks, this little hack that Microsoft did, 
This little hack that Google did, this little hack that Apple did, you won't be able to do it yourself. Apple's idea was quite small. The iPhone made phone calls, sent texts, ran apps and played music, and so did all the other phones. Why did the iPhone work? Because he thought small. He thought small about the biggest problem in smartphones. This is Steve Jobs' brilliance right here. The biggest problem, and this is what you need to do. If you can find that biggest problem and come up with a small solution to solve it, it's your idea that's going to ultimately make the world change itself. So what was it? How did Steve Jobs get all those people on iPhone when we really didn't need that thing? How did you run an app on a Blackberry or a Windows CE phone? How did you install an app? You all are too young to remember. But you literally had to know where that app lived on the web, right? www.wherethisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisisis
check the water quality, I have to go to the store and buy chemicals, I have to order them, I have to feed them into my hot tub. So I thought that's not the way the world should work. The world of hot tubs should be better than that. Here, the world of hot tubs should be that the Amazon drone knows when I need chemicals in my hot tub, it flies over my house, the lid opens up automatically and it squirts the chemicals right in. That's the way the world should work and so I built that world for my hot tub. I went out and I bought a radio controlled motor for the lid and I wrote a little Windows Phone app to open and close the lid to my hot tub. That took me two hours of coding. Two hours. You all have a chance to do an hour of code over lunch today, you're halfway through the first feature of my hot tub. That's all it took. It took me longer to buy the parts and figure them out how to hook them up than it did to write the code for it. And so now my hot tub can open and close its own lid. Next thing I thought is, I don't want the Amazon drone squirting chemicals into my hot tub if there's a person in there. Or if there are certain people in there, I actually do want it to squirt chemicals in the hot tub at that time. So how do I do that? I drain the pool, I put a sensor, a piece of tape on the hot tub so that I can measure the water level. You sit in the hot tub, the water level gets higher. Now here's where I began to look at the data. This got really interesting. Based on the water displacements, I know how much you weigh. I can estimate whether or not how much your head weighs based on the water displacement. And I can estimate your weight very accurately. See, here's the cool thing. You come up with this little hack of the world, and all of a sudden, there's a lot of possibilities that open to you. So now I know, in fact, after two weeks of my son and daughter getting in the hot tub, my hot tub figured it out. Ah, oh, Shay's in the hot tub. Bailey's in the hot tub. It knows. It knows who's in my hot tub. It was kind of cool. I was traveling in Europe and I got alert and it said, hey, uh, unknown human flesh in your hot tub. And I said, so how much does it weigh? And it said like 305 pounds. And I'm like, 305 pounds? So who's sitting in my hot tub? Right? And so I'm starting to kind of thinking it through, thinking it through. And I thought, okay, if you subtract my daughter's weight, you're left over with about 185. <gasps> Dylan. It's Bailey and Dylan. It's the only thing it could be in my hot tub. And I'm panicking, right? I'm in Holland. I'm 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 miles away. What am I going to do? And I thought, oh, wait, close lid. <laughs> and I waited and I waited. Five minutes later, I get a text from my daughter. and She's like, dad, your hot tub is crazy. And I said, no, sweetheart. That is called the chastity protection feature. And it's there to protect you, my darling. And so see, this thing is already working, right? I can maintain the water level quality. I can order chemicals. I can do all kinds of cool stuff with this. Do you know we have lasers that can shoot through water and determine its chemical composition? Do you know that we have lasers in refrigerators right now? I'm building a new house, and I'm looking at refrigerators, and there is a mechanism that as soon as you close the door, it shoots lasers around and figures out what you have in. It knows the chemical composition of chicken. It knows you have chicken. It knows how long that chicken has been there. It doesn't matter if you take it out on this shelf and put it in on this shelf. It knows more about the contents of your refrigerator than you do. Um, it can monitor usage so it knows when people are in it. It can troubleshoot itself. I measure the voltage consumption and I know when my seals and bearings are beginning to wear so I can replace them. And I'm thinking next summer, I'm going to build a 3D printer that just reprints the seals and bearings as they're wearing out so that I don't ever have to do any maintenance at all. You all are going to be the first generation that doesn't have to maintain any of your devices. You all are going to be the first generation that as adults no longer need to shop. Because when your toaster goes out, it's simply going to order its replacement. Your clothing is going to be on the Internet of Things. There's going to be an Internet of shirts and belts and pants. And they're going to be able to talk to each other. Do you all understand what's going on in computing? These things that you all cherish so much, their days are numbered. What do you need? Why do you have, why is this phone so large? This phone is large because it needs a screen to communicate with me. I need to be able to tell it things. The larger it is, the more it serves me as a user. I can see it. There's more space between the characters. But now we're getting to the point where we have Cortana and Siri and Google Now and M that we talk to our machines. 
What happens when we get to a point where our machines are all like my hot tub and completely self-maintaining? What then? We don't need the screens anymore. Now, if you take away this screen, guess how much of the battery goes with it? Somewhere between 73 and 78 percent of the battery does nothing more than power your screen, which means you don't need a screen, you don't need the battery. This computer is, I'm glad I chose that particular finger. This computer is that big. That's the amount of electronics in your phone that actually do something besides light the screen. That means, and, and by the way, Moore's Law is going to make that a lot smaller. Within a two or three years, that's going to be about that size, just from the knuckle to the tip. Five to eight years, it's going to be the size of my fingernail. All the power in your cell phone in the size of my fingernail. That means it can be, it can be woven into the braids of your hair, a supercomputer woven in, because that hair can hold a lot of computing power. It can, it can sit in the, it can sit in the, uh, Right? Just the little tip of this right here could hold a, hold a very powerful computer. Your earrings could be computing things right now, the buttons on your, on your coat. They could be talking to each other. If I say, that's a nice hoodie. I like that hoodie. All I'd have to do is a gesture, right? Maybe one of my devices, I gesture toward you, and that hoodie talks to my device, tells me where I can buy you. Not you, but you're a hoodie. Your totally cool North Face hoodie. Where can I get that? I have it ordered to my house or 3D printed at my home in my size. Right? That hat you have on, sir, is going to have the computing power of this entire school system and all their server and cloud computers combined. This is what's coming. This is the world that you guys are entering, and this is the world that you guys get to be creative in. So now let's talk a little bit instead of what's, so what's out there, I need you all thinking about that. Everything you run into in your life is a chance to think small. Everything that you come across in contact with that's broken is a chance for you to think small and hack that particular problem. Now, what about in here? How do you prepare your mind for this? How do you get to a point where you can live a creative lifestyle? Because the deck, the deck is stacked against you all. Creativity is really hard for you all. We tell you, take STEM courses. When the creative courses are the art courses. Creative courses are philosophy. Creative courses are psychology. You can be taught to factor a trinomial with zero amount of creativity. Just a bunch of brute force rote algorithms. Creativity is your problem. You're, you have chances to code. You have chances to do math. What about creativity? How do you nurture that? Your parents aren't going to do it for you. Your parents are scared. Your parents are scared that you're going to be living in their basement until you're 40. Your parents want you to go out and get jobs and make money and be independent. Your schools, your teachers over here, they are beholden to exams that they can't control. They have to train you all to jump through hoops that, that the school needs you all to jump through in order for the school to maintain accreditation. They have to, they have to pay homage to Common Core. It's creativity ain't going to come from your parents. It ain't going to come from your schools. It's going to come from inside here. And I'm telling you, if you want to be successful, creativity is the way to go. It's the one thing. There's going to be a lot of people out there who can code. There's going to be a lot of people out there who can factor trinomials better than you. What's going to get you ahead? What's going to get you ahead are those little hacks. Paying attention to the things that are broken in this world and having the skill set to fix them. So your brain is really important and you are the only one that can control it. So here's the first thing I need you to understand about your brain. There are places on this planet where your brain is going to be more active, your brain is going to be more creative, and your brain is going to be able to find those hacks and those small things. Where are they? Do you know where your center is? Sheldon Cooper knows where his center is. Where is yours? You've got to find it. It's out there somewhere. I don't know where it is, but it's a place that allows you to think more. I discovered mine by being told what it is. And in fact, mine's my hot tub, my celebrated hot tub, the only hot tub on the internet of hot tubs. But it was my daughter that had to tell me it was my place. 
because I was ready to get, I was, it, was, it broke down again. Six months earlier, I had just replaced an $800 pump. Now, six months later, it blows out again. No way, I'm getting rid of this hot tub. And my daughter stopped me. She's like, Dad, what are, are you getting rid of the hot tub? I said, yes, I'm getting rid of the hot tub. It's, it's too expensive. She said, wow, how much is this repair costing you? I said, 800 bucks. And she said, 800 bucks? Dad, how much are your ideas worth? Now, what? What are you talking about? My, well, that has nothing to do with my hot tub. Dad, it has a, Dad, are your hot tubs worth 800, are your ideas worth 800 bucks? I'm like, oh, yeah, my ideas. Yeah, of course they are. <laughs> she said, are they worth 8,000 bucks? And I'm like, oh, yeah, my ideas, totally worth 8,000 bucks. And she said, well, then fix the hot tub. I said, what are you talking about? She said, Dad, that's your spot. How many times do you come dripping across the kitchen floor from the hot tub? Where's my notebook? Where's my voice recorder? I have this great idea. She said, Dad, it happens so often that Shay and I won't bring our friends over when you're in the hot tub because we're scared they're going to see you shirtless. <laughs> that's my spot. For some reason, the warm, the combination of the warm water, right, by the way, that warmth, there's no coincidence that we have this kind of urban legend that you have your best ideas in the shower. The, the scientific theory is that it's a womb-like experience for us, right? It's wet, it's warm, and our mind allows us to go back to that primeval state of just being clear and thoughtful. It's my spot. What's yours? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go through life understanding and being mindful of your own brain processes. There is a place where you are going to have more clarity of thought than all the other places. So the next time you have an idea, I want you to stop and think about where are you? When are you? Is it early in the day? Is it late in the day? Is there noise? What, what environment? Is there noise? Is there quiet? What is it? Where? When? What? How? Why? Why are you so creative right now? Forget the idea. It's probably a stupid idea. But you had an idea. And that's the point. I want you to get to a point where you can trigger those good ideas. And if you're not mindful of where, when, why, and how you're having them, you won't be able to, to, to cue them up. So that's the center. There's three things that you need to understand about your own brain in order for you to activate your creativity. Your center is the first one. Your second one is distraction. Now, I found my distraction also the hard way. Because a distraction is something that takes your mind out of its present. Look, we are human beings, and, and this instrument up here is powerful, but it's flawed. We are subject to anxiety. We are subject to panic attacks. We have depression. You know what that's called? That's called normal. We have too many things going on. Our parents have expectations of us. Our friends have conflicting expectations of us. Our teachers have expectations of us. We've got to get into college. We've got to pass this exam. This is pressure. This is anxiety. Have you ever had a panic attack? Of course you have because it's normal. So that's normal. You can't prevent this stuff. So what can you do? When, that, when the world begins to overwhelm you, find your distraction and just bask in it. I also found out my distraction the hard way. It's live music, and I didn't know it. I have this routine in the morning. I'm a writer. I'm either writing code or writing prose on a regular basis. I sit in a quiet spot in the morning, my spot, my little rig in my house, and I work. And the way I work is I review what I did yesterday, and then I start writing co more code or writing more prose or something, right? So I review, then create, review, then create. One Thursday, I reviewed what I wrote yesterday, and it was perfect. Not a single edit. This has never happened before, and my mindfulness kicked in. Hey, wait a minute. This is a break in the pattern, James. Why was something you did Wednesday morning so good? And I had no answer for it. Next Thursday comes around. Same thing. I read what I wrote Wednesday, and it's perfect. Two times in a row, something's going on. And then I realized it was Tuesday night at Numos. Numos is a, a, a live music venue in downtown Seattle on Capitol Hill. Numos is the place made famous by Nirvana and, and Soundgarden and, and all the great Seattle bands of the 1990s. I was going there looking for a guitar teacher, a guitar mentor for my son. And whatever it was doing to me, it was clearing my mind. It was completely 
overwhelming my ears, complete visually this amazing guitar. Holy cow, no wonder people want to sleep with musicians. It's amazing. The sound just pounding through my body. Boom, boom. The ability to stand in a crowd of people and yell this primordial scream. I came home from that completely and totally clear of mind and exhausted of body. It worked for me. So what are your distractions? Is it running? Is it playing soccer? Is it cooking? What is it that takes you away? You need to find that thing because then when the world begins to overwhelm you, you've got something to take you away from it just for a little while and come back to that same world refreshed. This is so important to me. I built a music room in my house and I don't even play. My son's a guitar player and I put up an ad on Craigslist. Come and play good music, not jazz, I'm sorry. That might be somebody's distraction, it's not mine. I want good grungy rock and roll. I'm, right, if you play Rush, the beer's free. If you play Led Zeppelin, it's the beer's free. If you play, if you play Taylor Swift, please go away. Right, if you play Adele, please go away. That's not my distraction. You can get to choose your distractions, I get to choose mine, right? Mine's royal blood. Wow, what a band. So what's yours? I need you to be mindful of when your brain is completely empty, when your brain is taken away. There's no anxiety, there's no stress. You're not thinking about your friends, you're not thinking about the next Facebook post. What is it? And there's one more. Beyond your center, Beyond your distraction, there's one more thing to optimize your mental health for your creativity. One more thing. Can you guess what it might be? Psychiatrist. <laughs> Psychiatrist help. Your inspiration. What is your goal? Mark Zuckerberg said Bill Gates was his inspiration. And look where Mark Zuckerberg has taken his, his career. Do you have inspirations that you can follow? <laughs> Guiding lights that help you through your creative processes? I do. I do a lot of public speaking, and so I have people whose spe speeches I watch before I have to go give a big talk. I've got a talk, I'm giving a keynote at South by Southwest in Austin in March, and you better believe before I go on stage, I'm going to watch Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. I'm going to watch uh, We Will Fight Them in the Fields, We Shall Never Surrender speech of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill's good if you're British, Winston Churchill's good. But I'm sorry, Martin Luther King is the best, by far, bar none, best public speaker of all time. But then there's also Amanda Palmer, there's also Michelle Dickinson. They are better than me, and this is why they are my inspirations. They're really good at something that I want to be good at. When I'm writing and I have writer's block, I read Sam Harris. I read Ron Judd. I read that guy, I don't even know his name is, but he writes a column in Time Magazine and it's really freaking good. David Rakoff, these are my inspirations. If I ever want to try to say something clever, I'm going to watch John, I'm going to queue up a, a marathon of John Oliver, I'm going to watch one after the other after the other, because there's inspiration in there. Martin Luther King said, I hope, dream that one day my four little children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Holy cow, that is deep, that is profound. Where did he come up with that? I once said, and I got quoted for this a lot on Twitter, software is the opposable thumb for the human mind. How did I come up with that? Did I sit down and say, oh, I'm going to come up with something clever today. I'm going to sit in my little spot, and I'm going to come up with something clever. It just came to me because I fill my life with inspirations who are profound. So if you want to be profound, hang out with profound people. Okay. Another piece of this creativity equation is that you guys, you all understand, you all are a science experiment. The first generation that's completely a science experiment. Neuroscientists are watching you all right now because you all are doing something that no generation has ever done before. You all have been raised by staring at screens. No generation has ever done this before. And we have no idea what it's doing to your brains. Is this going to be a good thing? Is this going to be a bad thing? We don't know. You all are one giant science experiment. But we do know this. We do know that your brain has not evolved for this constant entertainment. Your brain is not evolved for this constant intrusion into it by the world outside. 
We do know that your brain has evolved for solitude. In fact, your brain has evolved for boredom because for generations of your ancestors, we were bored. We didn't have anything to do. A few generations ago, we didn't even have lights. We went to bed as soon as it got dark because we were bored. Once we started growing our own food, we got bored. Once hunting, got, we got bored. Your brains have evolved to be bored. And if you deny your brain boredom, we don't know what's going to happen to your mind because we've never been able to study humans who have not been bored before. When my kids come to me and say, Daddy, I'm bored, I say, really? Oh, that's great. I'm so happy for you. Well done. Keep doing it. <laughs> because that boredom is important. That boredom is the way that your brain, over the centuries and centuries of its evolution, has evolved. That's the way it's absorbed and thought about life around it. By the way, the only thing that you're, you're doing right now, because you are not bored, your dreams are becoming more intense. We know that because that's your brain's way of dealing with the fact that it's not bored enough and it doesn't have enough solitude. Your dreams are becoming more intense. We don't know if that's good or if that's bad. I think it might be bad. So embrace solitude, embrace boredom. This is, that's my daughter, but I was only taking a picture of her in order to have an excuse to take a picture of this family. We were at John Howie's restaurant. It's very early, it's, it's, it's empty, right? They're the only other family there. And then hours later, it's now filled up. I just zoomed in on them. What are they doing? Look at that guy's got his device. She's got her device. The kid's got her device. We watched them for two hours. They were our mealtime entertainment for two hours plus. This is John Howie. This is not a quick dinner. For two hours plus, we watched this family stare at their devices. That's all they did. One time they talked. And we were like, oh my God, they're talking. One time the, 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 the wife or girlfriend, whatever, uh, picked his, looked at her phone and said, hey, honey. And we're like, oh, they're talking. Look at this. <laughs> that was their only human to human interaction. He laughed and then they went back to their. I hope this is not your family. If it is, I'm sorry. Come on, man. I'm this is how we're spending our lives. Next time you're at the airport, go see how many people are staring at their devices. Next time you're in Starbucks, look at how many people are staring at their devices. Next time you're anywhere in the mall where people are interacting with each other, they're all staring at their devices. We don't know if that's good or bad for your brain, but we do know that there's creativity in solitude. Look, I work for Microsoft, and, and we have been trying to chase Google in advertising income for decades and tens of billions of dollars. And then along comes Facebook. Along comes Mark Zuckerberg. And Facebook is kicking Google's butt in advertisement. They're growing faster. They're the biggest threat to Google. How come we couldn't do this? Because money doesn't replace solitude. And guess what Mark Zuckerberg does? He takes two days off of technology every week. He actively seeks out boredom and solitude because he knows it makes him more creative. I like to say, next time you meet somebody from Google, look at their butt because you're going to see Mark Zuckerberg's boot print on that sucker. We couldn't do this, and Mark did because he embraces solitude. It makes you more creative. Your brain is capable of magic, but you've got to let it do that. Playing games on your phone and posting pictures of your junk to Facebook is not doing anything for your brain. So where is that solitude place for you? Where is that place that you can go and just be bored? Next time you think I'm bored, I want you to congratulate yourself. Your brain is getting smarter because of it. All right, there's one more piece to this. In this age of computer science, in this age of STEM, in this age of take more AP math, take more AP science, take more AP engineering, in this age, I do not want to let you all be completely divorced from art. Because art, so if someone asks the question, if you're not good in math, can you be good in computer science? I think if you're not good in math, you can be great in computer science. Computer science is about creativity. You need an art. Do you have one? 
we don't fund art anymore. You all don't get art anymore. You have to pay extra for it. Parents have to volunteer for it, right? It's way down on the list. It can't be down on your list. You have to be creative. Do you have an art? There is one, maybe some of you all suffer from anxiety and, and depression. Actually, I know you all do because it's called normal. The, the one thing that works, the one thing that works more than SSRIs, more than any other type of therapy, is thought replacement therapy. When your brain is thinking all those bad thoughts, you can take it away to another different <laughs> thought where you can be happier. That's your art. I have several pieces of background art that I go to when the world overwhelms me. I have my writing, and I'm generally writing two things because I don't know which one I'm going to be able to concentrate on, my books and my blog, and then Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Old school Dungeons and Dragons, dice and paper screens, cardboard screens, books, right? I am the dungeon master for my 18-year-old son and all of his friends. We played last night. It was totally killer. That's my art. So when the world overwhelms me, I start thinking about that encounter with the dragon that I'm planning for them. I start thinking about that blog post I want to write. If you want to read uh, some of the results of my work, go search for me online and find my blog on medium.com, right? That art that you can escape to and do. That is going to make your brain more creative because uh, embracing a creative lifestyle is important. So what is it going to be? Teach somebody else something. That's one reason that high school teachers are lucky. Some of the most creative people on the planet because they're thinking about their art. It's their job to think about their art. You cook. You draw cartoons. You play music. You brew beer. Well, no, never mind. You design something. You, you do film. Do something. Find an art. Find a background because your brain needs it. If you don't embrace creativity, creativity won't embrace you. If you don't lead a creative lifestyle, creativity is not going to be part of your life. So find something creative and make it part of your life. So here are my five suggestions for making yourself more creative. Your parents aren't going to do this for you. Your teachers aren't going to do this for you. The only person capable of making you more creative is you. So pay attention to the world outside. Find what's broken and hack it. Think small. This isn't about changing the world. This is about hacking the world and letting the world change itself based on your hack. And I want you to turn your mind internally too and understand your own creative thought processes. Understanding your inspirations, understanding your distractions, and understanding that one special place where you can find your center. If you do that, you will be leading a creative lifestyle, and that lifestyle will make you more creative. My name is James Whitaker. If you like this, please follow me on Twitter. Uh, read my blog on medium.com. I work for Microsoft. Peace. <laughs>